let me read to you a passage from the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 26 to 38. It's the Gospel for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary on December the 8th. St. Luke writes, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin espoused, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel entered and said to her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. When she heard this, she was troubled at his words, and considered within herself what manner of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found grace with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, and will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of David his father, he will reign in the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know man? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One who will be born of you will be called the Son of God. Behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who has been called barren is now in her sixth month, because nothing is impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. That's from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38, for the feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary on December the 8th. And so we are led to think of Mary Immaculate. In the papal decree of the 8th of December 1854, entitled Ineffabilis Deus, Pope Pius IX, who is now beatified, pronounced and defined that the Blessed Virgin Mary, and I quote, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular privilege and grace granted by God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the human race, was preserved exempt from all stain of original sin. It is therefore a dogma of the Catholic faith to be received by the faithful as being divinely revealed that Mary was conceived free of all stain of original sin from the first moment of her animation as a human being, which is to say, from the instant of her conception. Sanctifying grace was given to her before original sin could have taken effect in her soul. Original sin was not removed from her soul, as it is removed from others by baptism. It was excluded. It never was in her soul. The state of original sanctity, innocence and justice, as opposed to original sin, was conferred upon her, by which gift every stain and fault, all depraved emotions, passions and debilities, essentially pertaining to original sin, were excluded. But she was not made exempt from the, tempor from the temporal penalties of Adam, from sorrow, bodily infirmities, and death. The immunity from original sin was given to Mary by a singular exemption, an exemption from a universal law through the same merits of Christ by which other men are cleansed from sin by baptism. Mary needed the redeeming Saviour to obtain this exemption and to be delivered from the universal necessity and debt of being subject to original sin. 
the person of Mary, in consequence of her origin from Adam, should have been subject to sin. But, being the new Eve, who was to be the mother of the new Adam, she was, by the eternal plan of God, and by the merits of Christ, withdrawn from the general law of original sin. Her redemption was the very masterpiece of Christ's redeeming wisdom. John Henry Newman, in his letter addressed to the Reverend E. B. Pusey, invokes the patristic testimony that Mary was the second Eve. As the first Eve came from God's hand, filled with grace, so did Mary, the second Eve, and this by virtue of the merits of the one Redeemer, her Son. No controversy over the Immaculate Conception on the European continent arose before the 12th century. For various reasons, eminent theologians became divided at that time. It's the Middle Ages I'm talking about. For instance, Aquinas at first pronounced in favour of the doctrine in his treatise on the sentences. Yet, in his Summa Theologica, he seems to conclude against it, and learned books have been written to vindicate him from actually having drawn the negative conclusion. His difficulty appears to have arisen from the doubt as to how she could have been redeemed if she had not sinned. Well, the famous Dun Scotus, who died in 1308, at last laid the foundations of the true doctrine so solidly and dispelled the objections in a manner so satisfactory that from that time onward the doctrine prevailed. He showed theologically that Mary's sanctification after animation followed in the order of nature and not of time. And so he taught the Blessed Virgin received from her Divine Son the greatest of redemptions through her preservation from all sin. From the time of Scotus, not only did the doctrine become the common opinion at the universities, but the feast spread widely to those countries where it had not been previously adopted. With the exception of the Dominicans, following Aquinas' doubt, all, or nearly all, of the religious orders took it up. And since the time of Pope Alexander VII's intervention of the 8th of December 1661, long before the final definition of 1854, there was no doubt on the part of theologians that Mary's privilege was among the truths revealed by God. Pope Pius IX in 1854, in effect, declared that the Church has always known at least implicitly, that this is a revealed truth. That is to say, the controversy among the medieval theologians, resolved by blessed John Duns Scotus, was ultimately but a hiccup. So then, today we celebrate, on December the 8th, the greatest triumph of the redemption, the most splendid work of the Holy Spirit in the soul and life of a human person, and the greatest thing about our illustrious Heavenly Mother. She is the mother of the Son of God made man, as the Council of Ephesus declared, and absolutely sinless from the first moment of her conception. Mary is the work of the mighty Spirit of God. She is our mother, our heavenly intercessor, who is united with our High Priest in praying for each one of us, her children. She, all holy, is the mother and model of the whole church. Let us love her, just as her son loved and loves her. Let us entrust ourselves to her heavenly and constant care. God wants us to do this, and by her prayers and her example, she will lead us to love and serve her divine son. The Feast of the Immaculate Conception is a great sign to us of the holiness to which we are called and it is a sign of the ultimate holiness we hope that God will effect in us, and which will be our final state in eternity.